What makes the Chinese the people we are? Welcome to part two of a special edition of Global Thinkers with me, Liu Xin. This production is jointly brought to you by CGTN, Renmin University of China, and the city of Nanping in southern China. And we are coming to you from the UNESCO World Heritage Site called Mount Wuyi. In the previous part, we introduced to you an important figure called Zhu Xi, who spent half a century here in Mount Ui in the 12th century and developed what's known as Neo-Confucianism. We also discussed how Zhu Xi's philosophy has shaped contemporary China and the Chinese. If you're interested, please go to the YouTube and look for part one. Over the next half hour, we will discuss the differences and similarities between the Chinese and other peoples in the world and whether there is a way to bridge our gaps. I'm pleased to be joined by four distinguished guests. They are Professor Yang Huiling, Professor at the School of Liberal Arts of Renmin University of China, formerly a Vice President of the University. Tamara Prozik, Research Fellow at the School of Philosophy of Monash University in Australia. Professor Javier Garcia, a senior international journalist before, but now a professor at the School of Journalism and Communication at Remy University in China. And last but not least, Professor Roland Boa at the School of Philosophy of Remy University of China. We also have teachers and students from Uyi University, a leading institution in research into new Confucianism. The warmest welcome to all of our special guests and to all of our audience members. Thank you very much. So without much ado, just very briefly um, to remind our audience or for those who haven't watched part one, um, some people are calling Zhu Xi, this figure that we are commemorating here, a second Confucius in China. Is it true? Is he so important? Yeah. I think uh, Zhu Xi marks uh, the great turning point in the tradition of Confucianism in Song Dynasty, of course. So after that, uh, he really became the key figure in the tradition and um, even more influential to, 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 to Chinese uh, people, I think. Because after Song Dynasty, you may know that the, the integration of the three traditions, uh, Taoism, uh, uh, Buddhism, and Confucianism. Mm -hmm. So uh, Zhu Xi uh, did a lot in the integration of the three traditions, I think. So he kind of recalibrated, can mm, we yeah, say, yeah. Confucianism yeah. with other school of thoughts. Mm, yeah. um, in the first part, mm. we were talking about one of the key mm. concepts mm. that he's highlighting. Mm. Of course, uh, uh, in, in line with Confucianism is this idea of Ren mm. and benevolence mm. and mm. The, the idea of reciprocity. Mm. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of uh, Trump supporters would like that very much because <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about reciprocity. Is that the same thing, Roland? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, what, is the, what is the reciprocity we are talking about here? What is the reciprocity they are talking about? Uh, I, I think the reciprocity they're talking about sounds, sounds more like revenge to me. <laughs> it's okay. not a genuine exchange. But they're saying, we give you this, you give me exactly the same. True, 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 yeah. But it doesn't actually mean that, I think. Mm. It doesn't actually mean that. What is the Chinese reciprocity? It's an inclusive, from my perspective, and there are many different perspectives on this, there's always an openness to drawing from the best of other cultures, other civilizations. And that's, as Professor Young mentioned, this is part of the process of incorporating uh, Confucianism, Taoist thoughts, uh, Buddhist thoughts into a framework that includes the best of these transforms them in light of the context, but is transformed itself in the process. So the double process of constant uh, development, updating, inclusion that mm. goes on. By that you mean reciprocity, the Chinese idea of reciprocity? That's, that's in part of the okay. dimension of reciprocity. Yeah, well you were mentioning the this Chinese scholar who played a very important role in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and he introduced this central Chinese Eastern idea, let's say, of treating others the way you want to be treated. How important is that? Is that lacking in a Western uh, context? I mean, if you want to add, you can of course why was this not included in the original text? 
Was it because it was lacking in a Western no. way of thinking? No, no it's not lacking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm meeting here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, love others as you as you love yourself. I mean, that's that's a, 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 a sort of old Western category which has kind of been forgotten. But I think Tamara is itching to say something about this. Yes, point. I am. Please. I am. No. What I wanted to say, you see, the, the benevolence is one translation of it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the word itself in Chinese has a much wider semantic universe, and benevolence doesn't do it justice completely. Mm. Why? Because the two wills that meet in that, will, in that word, that do that reciprocity, mm. they are equal, right? Mm. Benevolence, mm. In, the, in, in Western context, mm there is always a kind of a hierarchy. There is a goodwill from one, so towards the other. Doesn't include the reciprocity from the other side. So there is this kind of first hierarchical structuring in the word benevolence. I, for example, have a kind of aversion towards benevolent societies and those type of do-gooders. Mm. Because it, it, it assumes this position of, you know, somehow higher level. We are better, so we are going to help you. It's not, I don't know, that, that's my explanation. So there is no equality. Um, the second thing that I think is important within this context is that I think Chinese cannot think about themselves without thinking about others. They do understand that I, I, my ego, is actually uh, founded on we, on us, on, on, a, on a group. That there is no you know, individual identity without being, having all these connections with other people. Why am I maybe better, why do I better understand maybe that than you know, someone who grew up in a typically Western country? Because I come from a from also a very uh, a country that understood very well that I is rooted in we. And that is because we have Christian heritage, but we come from an Orthodox Christian heritage, which is quite different to Western Christian heritage. That's, okay, that's so, very... So, mm. you know, I mean, that's my vision of, of, of how Chinese think. I simply don't think they can think about themselves without thinking about others. I agree with, with Tamara, yeah. This is the difference of collective thinking and individualist thinking. No? It's the difference between the West and China. And regarding reciprocity, I think it's not the same love the other as you yeah. love yourself. Yeah, because and it goes back don't to Don't do the other what you <laughs> will not do it yourself. No, it's not the same. It's, yeah. it's not, it's the, not same, the same. But, but there, are, no. there are comparable concepts if we want to start exploring these. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, okay, okay. Be, they can be but is, there is a difference, no? And we, if we translate reciprocity in the actual times, that is win-win, win-win solution, no? And why the West always laugh about the win-win politics of China or the win-win trade of China. They don't understand that. It's always, if it's a win, it has to be a loser. Mm. That is the West concept. It's the economy, the economy, the economy of the West. Zero sum. Yeah, zero, zero sum. Mm. And it has to be a loser because there are two sides always of the same coin. The, yeah. And for China, it's win-win. You it's can win win-win. both. Yeah. And yeah. there is another thing. Roland said that reciprocity with Trump is not the same like the reciprocity in Chinese culture, and I agree with that. Why? Because reciprocity in, in Western culture means contractual reciprocity. So we have a contract. So it's not free giving. There is always a contract between a Transactional. People. Transactional. Okay. So it's self-interested, uh, the motive is self-interest. Mm -hmm. It's never just pure altruism. I'll do for you something because, I don't know, I like humanity as a whole <laughs> or something. That's the, the Chinese emphasize a lot morality, yep. moral values, um, <coughs> Confucius, you know, they talk about being a sage inside, even if you don't, you know, 
uh, the sageliness is like the ultimate pursuit <laughs> of human. D is that uh, yeah, very I, important? I think uh, the, the emphasis of Chinese uh, uh, morality or ethics uh, lies in the uh, judgment from others' perspective. That is a little bit mm -hmm. different with uh, similar things uh, bit compared with China in the West. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, uh, I think the basic logic of uh, benevolence or, or, or uh, reciprocity uh, is mutuality. Uh, but in biblical thinkings, there's uh, uh, normally used in a positive form. Mm -hmm. Do unto others yes. what you would like to, like to be done to you. Yeah. But in Chinese uh, analects like uh, uh, Confucius and also some of the writings by Zhu Xi, uh, normally use a negative form. Uh, do not do unto others what you, yeah. That's Don't a want little to be. bit, a little bit controversial. So can I understand it this way? Uh, I think it is good for me, you need to have it too. Yeah, that's and for the, the Chinese, is like, if I don't want to be done something, mm. I should not do it yeah. to others. Yeah. Mm. So is that kind of the fundamental ideas behind this idea of, for instance, China, you, mm. your system is not good. You need to have our system because our system is good for us. Mm. You know, this, <laughs> I don't know, this democracy, you know, freedom, yeah. uh, media, free speech, mm. because we believe it is good, you need to adopt it too. Is that kind of the yeah. problem we're so seeing the, here? The West is very, very focused on this one. On the, the one. On the positive statement. Yeah. On the, on the <coughs> positive statement. Well, one, and, size, and one size fits all. One size fits all. I like to think about it in terms of, uh, they know about it, I told them, about West has this central vision or linear perspective on things. Mm. You know how the Renaissance painters allegedly invented that perspective, where you see the houses and they get smaller and smaller and so on. And in Chinese painting, exactly. all the houses are the same it size. It is <laughs> isometric. So what it gives you, the West really adopted that perspective, they, that individualistic kind of view which, where everything starts from one point, comes back to one point, that one point possesses the picture, mm. it uh, establishes its universality, mm. there is no another in that picture. Mm. Chinese paintings, when I looked through them, I was so impressed. You know, you unroll the scroll and there is movement from various perspectives and there is movement not just in space but also in time. There is representations of mornings. So there are different perspectives. Chinese know that. They know you have to observe things from different perspectives exactly. at the same time. And what's wrong about the linear perspective? And this is not me now speculating. I actually read it, you know, in books okay. from art historians. Mm -hmm. They say that that perspective is actually kind of like a, a false representation of the reality because it is close to perception, but one is perception, the other is reality. That house might look very small, but it's still 10 meters tall, mm. not small. Mm. So in a sense, m my view of the West is that they do have this linear vision, which ultimately falsifies the reality. So in order for our audience not to get the impression we're here collectively bashing the West, <laughs> I do want to ask about, you know, what has been the fine tradition, the fine legacy of the Western perspective in shaping our world today? Because China also took in a lot of things from the West, right? Marxism, yeah. Yeah. socialism exactly. is a Western idea. <laughs> yeah. Roland. Yeah. Yes, well, that, that's... Uh, I, the inclusiveness or the willingness to engage with all different civilizations and incorporate what is the best, but what, also what works. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, what strikes me, if I can use an analogy, uh, with Zhu Xi's development of what's known as Neo-Confucianism, was in, in some respects a response to the fostering of Buddhism, uh, initially with the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, and the feeling was that, that Confucianism needed to take a step forward, to reform, to move forward and so on. Uh, and in the process, Chinese culture thought was, you know, transformed and so on. It seems to me that the role of Marxism in China has an analogous role. 
in a sense that it, it analogous. Took, oh, sorry, analogous. A similar role. Okay. A similar role. So, okay. Yes. Yes. In the sense that um, Marxism took root in China because of, of some fundamental commonalities, uh, as some basic or essential um, uh, socialistic factors already in Chinese culture. Mm. And in the process, it is a kind of enlightenment or a transformation that took place so that we're now at the point where China is today from about a hundred years ago. But in the process, Marxism was also updated. The mainstream was, was developed further in light of those experiences. So it's a two-way process. Would so you that's give where I connect, connect Jushi with, with the arrival of Marxism. Yeah. Mm. W would you give a, a concrete example or concrete point in what you just illustrated? Okay. I've, I've been to the capital of, or the center of the, uh, what was then called the Jiangxi uh, Fujian Soviet mm. in uh, Rejin. And uh, it's very interesting that a principle developed there when the, the CPC, the early uh, stages, uh, they developed principles. Make sure the peasants have adequate housing, enough food, clothing, and warmth in winter, mm -hmm. and then they'll become communists. They will follow their... Well, they'll follow the, they'll follow the party. They'll see that it actually ha makes a concrete difference to their lives. Yeah and then move forward. You know, it's very interesting you're talking about this because I'm looking at that wall there and it's written there, for instance, that's very similar to what you're saying. Basically, the roots of a regime is the people, is the folks. If you do not satisfy them, if you do not enrich them, you, do not, you cannot take roots. The old principle, the people are the foundation of the state, of the country, or the principle uh, taking the people as a centre or people-centred approaches to policies. That's mm. at this very concrete level, that's where it really took root. Professor Young, yeah. would you say that's something in common between yeah. Confucius, yeah. Yeah. between Zhu Xi yeah. and Marx? Yeah, of, co of course, of course. And I think Zhu Xi, uh, another important rule for Zhu Xi is just to try, uh, he tried a lot to uh, strengthen or emphasize the, the uh, uh, more concerns of to uh, ordinary people. Mm. That is also a, a tradition principle for Confucianism. And uh, uh, on the other hand, I think you may find a lot of similar things in the talk, in the theory of Marxism, mm. especially uh, uh, the Marxism adapted to Chinese context, That's right. including one of in Mao Zedong's writings, the, the most uh, famous uh, dictum is uh, serve the people, serve the right. people, only with uh, approval by the honored people and agreement or support by the honored people the rule and the governance uh, of the country could be successful. I think that is one of the successful uh, 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 experience of the Chinese Communist Party. But on the other hand, I think uh, you may know, uh, know more about that. In the West, there's also a lot of similar things mm -hmm. integrated with Marxism. For instance, you may know the principle of option for the poor. Mm. Is, which is a Catholic uh, principle ethic. Can I mention and, uh, uh, one yeah. of my favorite stories very briefly by Gore Moreau. It's Marx <coughs> enters a Confucian temple. Mm. And so a carriage turns up and Marx goes inside and meets Confucius sitting yeah. there and they start talking with each other. And Confucius mentions the category of the, the great harmony or the great togetherness. Marx talks about the proposal that uh, for a, a socialist society, uh, and so very concrete, very concrete. And in the end, Confucius says to Marx, well, my old comrade, and <laughs> Actually, uh, it's a great I story. To, yeah, <laughs> I, I think you should add to, uh, a very vivid example uh, with the biblical writings. I think that might be taken as a better translation for Mao Zedong's dictum, serve the people. But in biblical writings, there's a very interesting sentence. I came to serve, not to be served. I came to serve, not to be served. Meaning the ruler. Meaning, no, no, Jesus. meaning Jesus Christ, yeah, also something like the governor, ruler. How different are we, or how similar are we with the rest of the world? Because we emphasize Chinese characteristics, you know, our Chineseness, but in the end, as we both modernize, 
Are we more different than similar, or are we more similar than different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe for me, the best expression for Chinese uh, characteristic is the principle we could find in the Zhuangzi, in the writings of Zhuangzi. Mm -hmm. That is, East and the West are convertible, yet necessary terms in relation to one another. That is the, kind, the, the idea okay. of inclusiveness, I think. We are different from each other. We are yeah, well, yeah, East and the West are convertible. Convertible. Uh, yet necessary terms in relation to each other. Now, without the East, we cannot find the West. Very that is and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, vice versa. Well, that's the idea of complementarity, that we complement each other, except yeah. with the caveat, right? <laughs> I think that China is more complementary with the rest of the world than the other way around? Then, no, then the West, let's put it that way, because West has its idiosyncrasies which are not compatible, I think, with anyone, while China, understanding that humans are social beings, is compatible with the rest of the world, and we see that. Most of the countries actually, you know, are part of the Belt uh, and Road Initiative, and that demonstrates that they do think that the Chinese way is their way of modernization, hmm. rather than the Western neoliberal way of modernization, which is focused very much on everything individual. So individualistic yeah. economy, okay. politics, okay. everything. Mm -hmm. Professor Gad, yeah. yeah. I think the West could be compatible with the rest of the world <laughs> if he tries to be exactly. open, like exactly. any civilization, Chinese culture, no? be open to other cultures and not think that its values and its way of life and its system and its social model and economical model are un universal. Everybody has to adopt it. No, every people, every country has its forms and you have to respect it. The diversity of the cultures in the world is the one of our most treasures, the, the biggest treasure that we have and we have to respect it. And the West mm -hmm. always cherish this diversity is one of our values. I learned as a child this diversity in the sc at school. Mm. Yeah, why now, or in general, the West don't respect diversity? That is the point, I think. And the West can, of course, cooperate and collaborate, and China has learned a lot of things from the West, and everybody can learn a lot of good things from Western culture, mm. but has to try not to impose his values to others. Roland? Two very quick thoughts. I think as the West is, is widely agreed now by analysts is facing a multi-dimensional crisis. It's been building for decades and it may take a long time to uh, f find the reasons and sources of renewal. That old principle, uh, it's, it's a common saying, things, but also it's very philosophical. Things that oppose each other also complement one another. And that that should be the approach. We'll give it some good thought. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it there and let the audience think for themselves. Um, I'm sure we still have a little bit time. Is there anybody who want to take this opportunity to ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, it's a very uh, great pleasure for me to have a question here. As a teacher from the uh, University of Wuyi, we are local here. Chinese people, Chinese students, mm -hmm. How shall we do, or what we can do to better understand the Jewish ideology and to spread it? Um, maybe Professor Young, and then uh, whoever uh, wants to take Roland. that question. Okay. Yeah, uh, very quickly. Uh, the comparison between uh, uh, the students and the scholars nowadays with Zhu Xi is something like uh, the co a similar comparison between Chinese tradition and the Western uh, tradition. So, uh, for instance, uh, Zhu Xi is a very good example to integrate different things together and uh, uh, integrated or intertwined, I think. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the relevance of the uh, Western tradition is also the relevance of Zhu Xi's philosophy contemporarily, I think. Thank you. Any other suggestions? Uh, some very practical suggestions. Uh, I know that the fourth confidence is cultural confidence. I would also suggest educational confidence. Mm. Confidence in uh, Chinese learning, Chinese educational systems in engaging. And I see that growing day by day, but I feel it's very important as a, as a principle in 
the context of increasing person-to-person -person exchanges. And that's where things really move forward. Any other question? One last chance? All right, okay, we have two. All right, why don't we take these two questions together and then we'll wrap up with the answers. All right. Because um, recently I'm studying the related course, so I want to ask, in the context of globalization, what's the significance of the cultural exchanges between China and Western countries for building a community with a shared future for okay. mankind? Significance of cultural exchanges. exchanges. Yeah. Okay. Your question, please, Jibin. Do you think that the phrase go with the flow is a good expression to describe the teachings of China, the Taoism and New Confucianism? Mm. Yeah, that's it. All right. Whoever wants to take both questions uh, at the same time? If I could be very brief, I just uh, use uh, two quotations to, to, to respond to both of you. Mm -hmm. One is that uh, you may know that uh, uh, John Newman, the first uh, uh, president of the UCD in uh, Ireland, Dublin, uh, he said that to live is to change. Mm -hmm. uh, to be perfect is to change frequently. Yeah, has, it means have, you, you have changed frequently. So exchange is also the change, I think. Uh, uh, the, the second, uh, uh, I also... Very philosophical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. And but another quotation is from Chen Yinqiu, a quite a famous Chinese philosopher. He said uh, uh, the experience of new Confucianism is to taking something from other traditions, taking something as a treasure, but returning the casket. What about go with the flow? Do you think she should go with the flow? You may read a little bit more I can, since about you're, the change. Since if I got right, right, you're from Russia, right? Yes. Well, I'll remind you of a very famous movie, Russian movie, Stalker, mm -hmm. you know, by Tarkovsky. Yeah, yeah. There is a journey there described, and they are all journeyed to a special room or a zone where every wish will be fulfilled. The point is when they go the journey is important. They go and get to the room, never enter the room, because the journey already changed them. So the flow can be, you know, it can have its obstacles. It's up to you to, to decide whether you go to the flow or you change the flow a bit. It's really up to everyone. Mm -hmm. But cross the river feeling the stones. Mm. Like yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's also important uh, to remember that, um, the, especially in the current context, that the world historically has a number of civilizations, and mm -hmm. obviously there's reasons for focusing on Western civilization in comparison with China, but there's Russian civilization, there's a thousand years old Iranian civilization, Indian civilization, etc., etc. Uh, so I suggest we also need to yeah. consider the multiplicity and contributions that can take true, place. True. Well, I guess the conversation can go on and on, but uh, our time is very limited, so we have to leave it there. Many thanks once again to my guests, uh, Professor Yang Huiling at the School of Liberal Arts and former Vice President of Renmin University of China, Tamara Prozik, Research Fellow at the School of Philosophy of Monash University in Australia, Javier Garcia, Senior Spanish Journalist on International Affairs and now Professor at the School of uh, Journalism and Communication of Renmin University of China, and uh, Roland Boa, Professor at the School of Philosophy of Renmin University of China and of course from all of you from Uyi University. Thank you so much for having been with us for both parts of the discussion. And with that we come to the end of this special production called Global Thinkers with me Li Xin coming to you from the picturesque Mount Uyi. Come here for a visit if you can. As always you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team thank you for watching. You've got the point. <laughs>